Hi, this is Dave. Today I'm going to tell you about uh, my diversions over my holiday weekend this last weekend. And uh, as you might know, I've mentioned in the past that I take dives into my uh, crawl space in my basement to find some of my old uh, gear. And uh, this time it was no exception. Uh, we had a um, we had a white elephant gift party uh, that was done virtually over Zoom, and the both the wrapped gifts and the real gifts were virtual so I was free I had free reign to go get any nerd stuff out of my uh, out of my crawl space that I could find uh, to give as a pretend virtual gift in the game the, so what I found is this the Radio Shack electronic TV scoreboard that my parents gave us as a gift presumably probably for Christmas uh, in about 1981 uh, this game that while the box is seen a little is a little worse for wear uh, this version has six different games on it. It connected to your TV. And the interesting thing about it and why I'm showing it to you today is, um, is that it's a first generation video console. Um, it was one of the first uh, set of very many video game consoles available uh, to, to run on and to use in your home and on TV. So I thought I'd tell you a little background of what I learned about, about the device, and then we'll open it up and I'll show you a little bit of the guts inside and how I decided to set it up. It's running, uh, I'm running a Pong tennis game up here right now, and it's stuck ball going back and forth between two players, but you can see I decided to put it on a five inch uh, or four and a half inch black and white TV so that it's sort of period correct because that's the way I would have used it at the time. In 1981, I hadn't gotten my Commodore 64 yet, which I got mine, I think in 1983. So I didn't have the 1702. I tried it out on there, but it looks good on there. But, uh, but I wouldn't have used the two together because once I got the 1702, I was using my computers exclusively. But before all that, there were these early game consoles. And this one happens to be handheld where each player uh, holds a different part of it. And these were called generically ball and, pat and paddle games. And what they provided is a suite of games that were based on the original Pong. So the original Pong is something like circa 1972. And uh, the, the, the idea to, to make these sort of games, uh, electronic games available to you in your home was uh, my understanding the, invent the invention of Ralph Baer. And uh, he, he, uh, he was the one that encouraged um, some of the original development of these games and developed one for the television in the early 70s. And these lasted all the way into the early 80s. Uh, where they kind of overlapped with the second generation of video game consoles that you might be familiar with. Say, for instance, the Atari 2600, that's considered a second generation. The Intellivision is um, the, some of those sets. So, but we had this, we had this game, the, one of the first ones. And what's interesting about it is that these are based on what was called Pong in a Chip or Pong on a Chip. There is one IC in there that runs all of those games. So once this became available from the General General Instrument Company in 1976, a whole slew of manufacturers acquired it and put out uh, put out video games to compete um, with uh, with the Coleco. Uh, the Coleco Telstar was one of the one of the first ones that used this chip. The chip is the General Instrument AY-3-8500. So initially, when I got the game out. Um, I, I, it didn't have a power supply, so I, I made a, a power a power supply for it that had the right connector, and uh, and got it working. And my first thought was, well, how am I going to get a device that has to output to TV's channel two or three to work on my equipment? Well, um, one common trick you use is to use a VCR, an old VCR. The VCR itself, the tape portion, doesn't have to be working. All you need is the ability to put an RF signal, the TV signal, into it and get composite out. And that's what I set up first, and that looked like this. Uh, th so the, the game clearly worked, and I wanted to have it you know, set up here at my desk at least for a while. And uh, I don't have room, though, for a VCR. That seemed like an awful lot of space to use. So I said, well, why? I thought to myself, why don't I just convert it to composite? And so I looked into that, and there's plenty of uh, information out there, uh, for instance, on the Atari Age website about how to convert this specific device to composite. Now, this specific device um, in this form factor with the, the right controller having the controls for the whole game and the left controller being separate is interesting in that uh, a couple of different companies came out with the, the same form factor. There's the Hanamex and also a German version called the Universum Multispiel. 
uh, and those those versions um, I think have just the four games and not the ones with the with the gun, but, but the, essentially the same device. So I went back to the crawl space to find the uh, 300 ohm to 75 ohm converter uh, that I needed to be able to plug this on the you know the coaxial F connector, and while I was in there, uh, lo and behold, what I found instead was was I found this, which is a uh, a black and white television, um, circa 1986, uh, four and a half inch, tiny little thing. That's what this is right here. And I thought, well, if I can get it working with that, then I don't need to do the composite mod. And it would be nice to have a TV around to work with if I have other old gear that has the RF modulator and want to display it that way. So I decided to get that working. It's a weird television, sort of a piece of junk in that uh, it has proprietary or unusual connections for both the antenna and for the power supply. It had a, a and, and so I decided to take it apart and uh, put it, put the power connector on it that was more common, a barrel connector with center positive and 12 volts DC. And uh, I had never used it before because I, I received it and saw that it took, you know, nine C batteries. Uh, you know, as I was a teenager then and I'm like, what am I going to do with that? I need the stuff to go with it. And um, my understanding from reading online is these are pretty common to find um, like on eBay and stuff like that. The the thing about them is they were pretty much like given away free, like if people went to look at a timeshare or something like that. So I think whoever gave it to me probably got it ridiculously cheap and I just wasn't interested and didn't look at it at the time, but got it working now. It makes a great, great Pong console because that's the way you would have played Pong. You played it on your television, not on a computer monitor. So let's look at the device inside. I'll show you a couple more screenshots of the game in action. And uh, and then we'll come back and uh, look at a couple unusual features of it. Uh, a hidden game and also something unusual I found about the uh, about the little television. So here's the Radio Shack electronic TV scoreboard at my bench. Um, let me give you a little tour of it if you haven't seen it already. It's got a knob up here that you can choose the game. They are target, skeet, tennis, hockey, squash, and practice. So this is the six game version. There was also a four game version that did not have the target and skeet games, which require a gun uh, that's plugged into this five pin DIN connector here. I do not have that gun. Uh, actually, I, I lost it in a, uh, in a with a Halloween costume of all things. Uh, it was so realistic that the police confiscated it when I was out on the street with it once. Um, so. Um, don't have the gun. Anyway, um, power switch, reset button, uh, serve if you're in manual serve mode. It can You can change the difficulty of the games by adjusting how fast or slow the ball is, by changing how large the bat size is, which is what you're manipulating with the paddle control. Um, you can change the slice, the angle at which the ball can travel. I think it's 20 or 40 degrees. And then... Um, it has a manual and auto serve mode, so you can choose when you're going to serve more auto. Um, then the left and right players are here. They're not literally attached to it. You can disconnect the left player, and it's got a, a quite an ex a cord that you can extend quite a bit so that you don't have to sit so close to each other. Uh, it has an, uh, an RCA jack at the end of a cable. This is a radio frequency, so this is a you know setup for a, for going into a television. Uh, this kind of connector. Uh, same thing I had on my Commodore 64, where you can take a 300 ohm uh, impedance input from a from an antenna or a source like this, and uh, or from an antenna or a source like this here, and put it out to your TV at 300 ohms. And then if you can use one of these little converters, you can put it on a 75 ohm, which you know more TVs have now. So let's take a quick look inside it. So it has two screws, one there and one in the bottom of the battery uh, compartment. It takes uh, a six double A's, so it's a nine volt device. Um, it has an AC power connector here. Well, weirdly and annoyingly, it uses the um, miniature phono uh, mono, mono uh, phono jack. So um, so uh, so I've made one of those up. And then it's got a, a selector here for to run on channel three or channel four uh, for your television. Uh, once the screws are out, it just uh, it snaps. Uh, it has snaps on the side.
All right, so what we have inside, let's start over here on the left. Here's the battery compartment. Here's the speaker, so it doesn't send sound to your television. You actually hear the sounds from the bottom of the device. Here's that five pinned in for the optional uh, gun connection for the light gun games. Uh, here's a potentiometer for the, the right control. Uh, and here's the board. So what we have is uh, an, uh, an RF modulator section here, the main, the main IC right there, that's the star of the show. So here, this is the, this is the general, the general instruments AY3-8500-1. The difference between the A-3-8500 and the 8500-1 is my understanding is the 8500 is PAL and the 8500-1 that I have here is, is uh, for NTSC. So it's in a dual inline package, uh, has various connections for inputs from the gaming devices and also outputs to other chips that are optional in the in the di in the circuit that you build, uh, and of course output to the video so that we can produce the RF signal. Uh, it has a sticker on it that says six uh, seven point five. It looks like I'm guessing that means the voltage that it the chip can take. Uh, it's not the year and month because right on the chip itself we can see that it, it's covered up slightly by the sticker, but here you can see the dash 8500-00-1, and over here I see 8120. Uh, so I think that this particular chip that I have is a later one, is I think it was made in 81 and probably the 20th week of 81. So here's a little glimpse of it, of the device in action. Let's start off with something simple, the practice game. So in the practice game, only the right player is active and all you're doing is playing against the wall. You can, you know, change the uh, bat size. You can even change this while the game's playing. We can change it to uh, fast, which is nearly impossible with the small bat, but we can change it to um, like what, back to you know the normal pong sort of tennis game, um, you know, it's okay. Uh, the game that I think I like the best is called hockey on here. It's called foosball, of course, on the German one. It's just um, the, it's called soccer on some other games, but uh, you know, pretty good play. Uh, you can get things like that where it sticks between there. That happens in real foosball, you know, on the table soccer, and uh, you can get yourself out of it. Um, this is the, this game has if you turn it halfway between this game and the next you get a special version of this called handicap where the right player has three men or three paddles or three bats and the left player only has two so it's the only game in here where there's a where you know there's a setting for a, a, a distinct disadvantage or advantage for one of the players uh, lastly a uh, curious thing that I wanted to show you about the television it's not a particularly quality television. It's made in Korea, but it has a, it has a Samsung tube. I don't know about the electronics. Look what happens here when I uh, when I shut the shut it off. See that bright spot there? This is reminiscent of this is what the Commodore Pet did. We saw this on Adrian's Digital Basement and uh, and on Frank's uh, channel about how they solved that problem with the pet. And this thing from 1986 has the same problem. So super curious, but that's those are the two little interesting tidbits I have for you. Yeah, so that's sort of the, the first you know video games that I ever played at home. Yeah. The AY3 uh, 8500 is an important piece of electronics history. I mean, it was the way that video games were popularized in the home. And you know millions of these things were sold. Uh, these paddleball games were fun because you played them against someone else. It didn't really matter that the game was a little primitive. Um, you know, switching between them, it could sometimes get in modes where it was stuck. That was part of the fun. It was like playing a bar game of f foosball or something like that. So, um, pretty neat and uh, and in that in that sense, still compelling to this day. So, uh, I'm going to close out and I'm going to leave you with uh, a little glimpse of what it looks like for me to dive into the uh, crawl space to find the next thing I'm going. It's going to be the basis for a diversion. So. Enjoy that. If you like this kind of content, uh, uh, g give me a thumbs up, please. If, um, if you, uh, otherwise, uh, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. 
uh, that you know that'll encourage uh, more content if you want something. So. I'm in the base basement. Previous owners, I guess two owners before me, uh, cut this hole in the uh, side of the basement and, and extended the house out that way and put in a crawl space instead of a full basement. Like the rest of it we have is a full finished basement. So here's what it looks like where I'm going and getting all my stuff. And I've got sort of a, got sort of a, I'll show myself, got sort of this, uh, you know, headlamp on and it goes way back there. So all my crazy boxes of stuff, some old monitors, but you can go all the way back there.